I've often said to people who have done, who are, who are interested in doing the AGA appliance, um, are you familiar with the AGA appliance? Unfortunately, yes, but not because of positive patient responses. Sure. Uh, well, what I was going to say before I ask you, what I was going to say is my understanding of that appliance is that it's essentially just putting mechanical force on the structures of the front of the maxilla, maybe a little bit of the bone, maybe the teeth, maybe a little bit of both. And uh, then there, those teeth are coming forward through the alveolar bone, just like you document in your article. So what I was thinking is, why would you wanna push the teeth forward through the bone? If you're gonna do that, you could at least add a little bit of bone there before you do the pushing, and that would at least make it safer. Um, so in no way could the AGA be uh, superior to something like SFOT. Your, your thought process is more sophisticated than people that are doing treatment in my region. So I applaud you. I'm impressed with your, yes. I think when we augment the bone, it can make the situation a little safer. But I think that the, the uh, I don't think that the AGA appliance is ever going to bring the whole maxilla forward, even though that's what it claims to do. I think it's pushing the teeth out of the bone. Right, right. And if you would feel comfortable answering, and I know this kind of drags you into the mud a little bit with the gossip, but do you think there's any credibility to the claim that the way the AGA works is by pressing on the nasopalatine nerve and triggering some kind of organic bone growth? No, no right? I, it, it it's doesn't total work. nonsense, right? It doesn't work. No. I think okay. you think if we want to be honest, we have to look back to skeletal growth and development. So um, you know, Ron, a lot of my interest is is looking at little kids. So if we take a huge step backwards and we look at breastfeeding babies, breastfeeding is where this starts. You have a child that's bringing their tongue up into the part of the mouth and the tongue pushing into the alveolar housing is what shapes the growth of the upper jaw and the width. And it's what brings the premaxilla forward. The, the, the baby working at the breast is what gets the lower jaw to come forward. And, and those movements start to kick off the growth and development, not only of the masseter and the, and the lower jaw, but also the mid face and the nasal passages. And that's the first time when we can identify whether or not a, a child is tongue tied. Then you think about nasal breathing, lips together, the foods we eat as we grow the first thousand days of life. This is what starts to grow and develop the jaws. If you have a child that's breathing with their mouth open, tongue posture is low, maybe adenoids and tonsils get larger. And, and you start to get this inward pressure from the cheeks. The mouth goes like this, then that starts to look like crowding. Then the lower jaw drops down and back. The maxilla might come down. Now we have our gummy smile patient or our open bite patient or our deficient patients. And so it has to do with the way the jaws grew. They grew in a downward backward trajectory that manifests as crowding. So when they get to the orthodontist at 12 or 13, they say, oh, you have crowding. The true answer is that their jaws are underdeveloped. They had a breathing issue long before anyone took out teeth. So to put in a toothborne appliance like an AGA or a Crozet or a DNA appliance or an ALF appliance or any of these appliances and to try to push the teeth is not really what's happening. We need to grow the bone itself. And so we need to look at the sutures and that's why MSC becomes important. Now, if we catch these kids early, like, like six, seven, eight and younger, then we can start to grow the jaws, but, but we have to, but we have to start really young right. um, to use toothborne appliances. 